Okay, good afternoon, a good morning, good evening, depending where you're joining us today. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Yelena Sokova. I'm the executive director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. And it is my greatest pleasure to open the today's event on nonproliferation, arms control and disarmament, changes in the field and career tracks. This is the first panel discussion in a series of outreach and other activities to encourage the next generation and particularly young women to enter the nonproliferation arms control and disarmament field. I am also extremely delighted to partner with the Institute of International Affairs in Rome and Federico Dell'Arche particularly uh, for today's inaugural event of a new Young Women in Nonproliferation and Disarmament Initiative. The field of arms control, nonproliferation and security have been dominated for decades by those, as people say, pale, male and yellow. While the situation has improved substantially in the last 20, 30 years, we are still in a situation where gender parity is an, an, an aspirational goal, diversity is lacking in the field and younger generation is particularly underrepresented. The lack, the lack of diversity, including gender and age diversity in this field is problematic for a number of reasons. One is that as private sector research shows, diverse teams generate better outcomes than homogeneous teams. In this respect, the gender gap hinders international efforts to address the threat of weapons mass, of, of mass destruction effectively. Another, another is the fact that high level decision-making um, about WMD issues impacts everyone, disproportionately excluding women and other vulnerable groups and underrepresented groups from this process is inequitable and it perpetuates unhelpful stereotypes about the masculine nature of hard security issues that stifle creative thinking. This is what drives the initiative that um, IAI and the BCDNP partnered to lead within the European Union Nonproliferation and Disarmament Consortium. The initiative includes a series of outreach events similar to the today's panel, a formal mentorship program, networking opportunities, internships, and other resources. To learn more about these uh, uh, different activities and resources, I encourage you to visit the websites of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation and the uh, Institute of International Affairs, um, respectively. We'll, we'll have information on both about these opportunities. I think it's also extremely timely that we are holding this event um, during the uh, period of pandemic and COVID because this is impacting uh, uh, young people and next generation uh, as everyone else, but probably even more because they, they are, um, there are not that many resources where they can learn about this. Some universities don't offer these courses at all, regardless whether it's online education or in person. But it's also probably a good time when those working in the field who have built their careers could actually lend a hand and share their experiences, their um, uh, mentorship services and other opportunities to share with those who are looking at where to head, uh, whether this is the field that might be a career path for them, whether it's a, a field where they just want to be informed citizens and contribute to um, peace and security in the world. Um, once again, I'm really grateful for the European Union uh, for the support of this initiative, but I'm also extremely delighted to uh, see and participate. Um, well, I'm not gonna be chairing it. Uh, I'll pass the microphone in a minute to Federica, 
But I'm so excited that you were able to join us, the other panelists, and looking forward to the discussion. And I'm even more delighted to uh, pass the virtual microphone to Federica, uh, who um, she and I are sharing the same alma mater, uh, although many years apart. But anyway, Federica, I'm so grateful and, and I'm so delighted with finally doing it. We've been discussing this initiative for over a year now. Federica, please take it away. Thank you so, so much, Yelena, and especially for the wonderful and great cooperation over the past year in building this activity and this initiative. I am so grateful as much as you are that it's taking shape finally. And I am beyond honored and I feel extremely privileged, privileged to introduce our speakers today to the audience. Um, incredible women who are, living, uh, who are living examples that women can actually succeed in this field, um, despite the enormous challenges, the obstacles, and let's face it, some stereotypes as well. Um, during our session, we will hear from the former United Nations High Representative for Disarmament Affairs, among other millions of titles and recognitions, and currently senior fellow at the VCDMP, Angela Kane. We will also hear from Ambassador Andersen, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Norway um, to Austria, from Dr. King Baines, um, Environmental Remediation Specialist at the IAEA, and finally from Dr. Heather Williams, currently uh, the Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, who is also a reference for those who work in the academic field. We have asked our speakers to start from three main questions. Um, how has the arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament regime changed over the years? What does it mean to work in this field and what are the most needed skills to succeed in this field? And how can we engage more women? So we've asked our speakers to talk a little bit about their experiences and what it meant for them to work in this field, asking to focus mainly on their specific career path. So for instance, Ms. Kane will talk about her experience working in international organizations. Ambassador Anderson will um, explore the diplomatic journey. Dr. Baines will share her experience as a woman working in hard science, and Dr. Williams will share her experience in working in the academic field. After the, their brief, uh, but I'm sure extremely valuable remarks, I will open the floor for some, for some questions. Uh, let me say that we've allowed our audience to send questions in advance, and we have already over 30 questions to address, but we will compensate them and so that we we can have an open discussion. And, but some uh, very housekeeping remarks. To submit your questions, if you're, if you're watching us on Zoom, please use the Q&A function. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please uh, email your questions to events at vcdmp.org. Another thing that I should um, underline is that the webinar will be recorded and possibly shared online after today. And if you encounter any technical difficulties, please email again events at vcdmp.org or message us on the on the chat. Oh, no, sorry, message the VCDMP on the chat. Well, I'm sure we will learn a lot from this conversation. So without further delay, Miss Kane, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Federica. Thank you very much, Elena. I'm delighted to be here and very rare that one is on a panel of six women. So that's really terrific uh, as a start and not that we had expected any different, but still it's good. Um, you had asked me to address also um, how uh, did I sort of have my career at the United Nations, particularly with disarmament, non-proliferation. And I think when I look at the title, I would have been a little bit daunted when I was starting my career because I was thinking, 
I didn't study disarmament. I didn't study non-proliferation. I didn't know much about nuclear weapons. So how did I end up, you know, where I ended up? And um, when I entered the UN, I really did not have a career plan. I always thought it was great that people knew what they wanted to do in their life. I did not. I was like in my mid-20s and I had no idea. But on the other hand, um, after I'd been there for a couple of months, I transferred to the office of the Secretary General. And that was at the time Secretary General of all time. So you know how old I am. But in any case, what happened was that each officer in the Secretary General's office had to be given the task of uh, of functions. And my function was I had to vet everything that came from the Secretariat that dealt with human rights, that dealt with UNICEF, that had dealt with information, and that dealt with disarmament. So that was my first exposure uh, to disarmament. And it was very touchy because at the time it was the height of the Cold War. And so everything that had to do with disarmament and arms control was extremely, extremely sensitive. So God forbid I made a mistake because then Secretary General would come down on me and sort of say, well, you didn't do a very good job basically vetting the material that, that I have. So every single piece of paper that came from the Department for Disarmament Affairs, as it was then, I had to basically vet. Also the speeches and I attended first committee sessions and um, you know tried to educate myself about that. And that was the time when you really had a lot of advocacy uh, for disarmament. I'm very happy that we also have someone from, um, uh, from basically the civil society because that was a million people went into the street when they had two sessions on uh, disarmament in the late 70s and, and, and early uh, 80s. And there was a lot of demands that something needed to be done about this huge buildup of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. And um, then after I left the Secretary General's office, I went to Indonesia and worked in development, nothing to do at all with disarmament. But when I came back, the disarmament uh, department remembered that they, I had done good work for them. And so they said, why don't you come back and work for us and we give you a, a job? So I did. And that was really fascinating. So that was my first time when I spent four years in disarmament. And that was in the mid to late 80s. And that was absolutely at the height of the Cold War. Remember that was Reagan and it was the evil empire, the Soviet Union then. And what the Soviet Union then did is they sort of opened their arms and they just said, you UN have to help us and talk to um, people who are in the West who deal with disarmament and arms control. We want to have contact with them. So actually what I did is I organized a lot of conferences. I traveled a lot to the then Soviet Union. I actually learned uh, Russian at the time because I always felt at unease that I couldn't understand at all what was happening, but I learned a lot about disarmament as well. So that was really something that was very formative. And uh, it was very, very important to, to do that. Uh, but then, what, uh, what happened is I went back and I did political work, I did management, uh, I did all kinds of other things, but I didn't do disarmament and non-proliferation until 2012, when uh, I said to the Secretary General, after just finishing a stint in management, that uh, I really wanted to do something substantive again. And he basically opened the door and sort of said, well, what would you like to do? And that job was open at the time. So that's how I ended up in disarmament. And when you say to me, what actually have changed? Let me say a little bit about the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the uh, measures that, that were happening. In the 80s and in 2012, when I started again, you had the same machinery. You had the first committee, you had the conference on disarmament. Nothing had changed there. Nothing had changed. It had gotten a lot more complicated. But when I took the job in 2012, remember that was just after 2009 Obama speech, you know, ending nuclear, we uh, nuclear weapons and maybe not in my lifetime. So basically, I think it was really important because it was a very hopeful time. And unfortunately, you had a 2010 review conference of the NPT, which was um, also very positive because it made a consensus final document that was very welcoming, that opened the door to the humanitarian initiative. And again, I thought that there was something where one could move something. And to me, that's always been very important that one can make actually, maybe just move the, the, the goalpost a little bit, but on the other hand, that you can actually have input in what you're trying to do and you can make a difference. So that's basically what I tried. And then in, the, in a couple of years, humanitarian initiative, I mean, here I am in Vienna, very important. We just had the entry into force of the um, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which Austria very strongly uh, put forward. But on the other hand, it has not gotten any easier. 
and uh, even that if that was considered progress by many, also consolidating the norm against nuclear weapons, I think it can be a very difficult path ahead. My message to the younger generation is don't think that you have to have studied uh, arms control or non-proliferation. Don't think that you have to know exactly what are the different types of weapons. Uh, that is also very important for the experts, but you don't have to have that knowledge if you want to go into the field. If you have a security background and if you have a political instinct about what is possible while understanding the wider field, that is really what is very important. So think of it a little bit with a wider lens and not only about the arms control negotiations, but think of it basically about security because that's what it's all about. And that's where we all need to come together. So anyone who wants to come, and yes, I think the, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the men contingent is still quite large in this field. So uh, I think all of us around the table here would very much welcome if we have more, uh, women around the table. Let me stop here and leave it over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kane and Ambassador Anderson. Yeah, uh, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, really great initiative. Um, I'll comment a bit uh, from the diplomatic side. Um, and uh, in preparing for today, I just, I looked back uh, at my years at the ministry, 23 years. And a lot has changed, really, really a lot has changed. Uh, when I started, um, there was one um, woman in the top management position in the entire ministry. Today, we have gender parity at all management levels, perhaps with even more women than men. Uh, so that is really um, a great uh, change. And this is important because it means that uh, the glass ceiling has been shattered and there are plenty of role models uh, and recruitment is merit-based, which is uh, of course key to any bu bureaucracy. That does not mean that there are no challenges uh, because once you have gender parity within an organization, you need to, uh, to keep working on it because it's never achieved uh, once and for all. And I also know that um, this might not be representative for every foreign ministry in the world. Um, and uh, so um, the themes that we're discussing today largely falls within the area of security policy and the security department in, in all ministries of foreign affairs. And I, you know, um, as well as I do, uh, why uh, this has been um, a male dominated field. Um, it's, uh, it gives haste, uh, high status to work on security policy because it's a core interest for, uh, for most states. Um, there is a link to the military and to the Ministry of Defense uh, where men often feel that they are more comfortable than women. Um, it sometimes can require some technical knowledge. Uh, some feel a bit intimidated by that, um, uh, female colleagues. Um, and um, there's also this underlying sort of premise within security policy that men protect and women need to be protected. Um, I'm not going to, to even say what I feel about that kind of um, sort of thinking and logic, uh, but it has underpinned the, the entire area of security policies. Uh, today, I'm most sort of encouraged by all the young women that I see. Uh, because I see a lot of young students, uh, I see uh, um, young professors uh, entering into this field with really expert competence that we need. And I think that's an argument uh, in favor of bringing in more young people because they have more updated knowledge. Uh, so, I mean, experience is good. We need that too, but you definitely need the updated uh, knowledge. Uh, and I would also say that maybe the... The, the views on security policy has changed over the years. It, ha it has um, become more complex in a way. We are better now, maybe than 20, 30 years ago, to look at it from different perspectives. We know that we need to have political scientists, to have people who are experts on the economy, to are, who are experts on law. So you can actually, you can enter into to this area uh, with a very, um, a uh, different background. Um, and, and I think this is also important. Um, I do, some say that, you know, men are more, uh, no, women are more um, uh, peaceful than, than uh, men. So they tend to go to, to sort of to conflict resolution and peace and mediation instead of the, you know, the hardcore security issues. I do not believe that at all. Um, uh, on the contrary, I think you need both men and women in all 
areas that we work on to bring in different perspectives. Um, so that is in itself an argument uh, for looking carefully that both um, or all genders are uh, represented. Now, what should young women do if they're interested in, in, uh, in the areas that we're discussing today? I would say uh, study what you're interested in, because as uh, Angela said, there are many different ways into this area uh, that you can, uh, but study something that you really, really care about, because then your chance of uh, becoming really a good student and getting the good grace and getting the opportunities will, to a larger extent, open up to you. But you also need to network. Uh, you need to uh, know people. You need to know where the openings are for internships. You need to, um, to look for opportunities in international organizations. Uh, there, and I think a mentor, like you're um, trying to, to establish here, a mentor program is very, very wise. Uh, and we also need to support each other. I will share just a few personal experiences and I had not worked on, on um, disarmament and non-proliferation until I came here. Um, but uh, I've been very lucky to have um, really good bosses. So pick a good boss, someone who will see you, someone who will encourage you, someone who will give you opportunity uh, to, to excel. Uh, and remember also that you don't always need to know as much as you think you need to know. And this is something that I always tell um, my young female colleagues at the ministry, uh, because some of them tend to think that they need to know all the details and have complete overview before they accept the task. That is not so. Uh, you learn uh, and, and take a challenge. If you're uh, presented with an opportunity, say yes and think about how you're going to solve it afterwards. Uh, because if someone asks you to do something, then they think you're you know, the right person uh, to do that. Uh, and uh, I would say um, network, to have good colleagues at all levels is important. Norway is right now on the board of the IEA. Uh, about a third of the board members are represented with female ambassadors. Uh, I think that's a good sign in itself. And it's also uh, good. I mean, I work equally well with my male and female colleagues, but it is good that there is this group of female ambassadors that I can um, uh, network with and, and uh, have a good sort of discussion uh, with. Um, but accept the challenges uh, you get, have a network, study hard, uh, and um, accept challenges. And I am also not so sure it's uh, possible to plan a career when you start out. Um, I had no idea when I started the ministry that I would be an ambassador of Permrep in Vienna. Uh, I wasn't even sure that I would stay in the ministry uh, and I started almost by default. So, um, so to find what you really care about, what's interesting to you um, and continue working on that. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Very great pieces of advice. I wish one day all countries will have the same gender balance as Norway, but it will happen one day. Um, and now the Turkim Baines, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to uh, share a little bit of a, a different perspective. Um, my background is quite a technical background. Um, but I want to encourage you that um, <laughs> that doesn't mean as women that we need to stop and um, we should seize that opportunity. So firstly, I just would like to thank the organisers for the privilege of participating in this. And I hope that through sharing my experience, I can encourage other women to pursue a career that's in technical or political discipline um, and to really make a difference in the world. So I have always been passionate about the natural world. And from the early age, I always wanted to work in the environmental field. So maybe I'm the exception here. Um, and certainly my role at the IAEA as an environmental remediation specialist enables me to support member states to clean up um, environmental impacts, some of which are caused by weapons testing, mining, and waste disposals from past activities. So at school, I was drawn to science and engineering. Um, I had a fabulous chemistry teacher um, and he was fun and he encouraged me, which was really important. Um, and that really grew my confidence. 
But interestingly, for, for my A-levels, I took chemistry, physics and English, which was frowned upon at the time. I should be taking maths or biology, not English. But actually, I think this was really important because it gave me a foundation to be a good communicator. Um, and certainly in technical and political uh, careers and subjects, we need to be able to explain difficult and complex concepts to others to enable progress. Um, so through positive communication, we can encourage others um, and inspire them to value our work uh, and to really make a difference. So where did I go then? So um, I believe that it is important to get hands-on experience. So for me, that in meant standing in a field with a digger um, and watching a drilling rig. It also meant uh, running mathematical models to determine cleanup criteria. It meant designing remedial strategies and working with interested parties to agree the remedial approach. And before I joined the IAEA, I took a strategic role for the UK's Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. And here I worked with operators, regulators and government, and I supported the development of regulatory guidance. And I was responsible for developing the UK's strategic approach to defining the site end state for its legacy sites. So in terms of remediation, it's all about protecting people and the environment, and importantly, about the reuse of land. And that often gets forgotten. Um, we need to maximise the reuse of previously developed land so we can minimise the impact on undeveloped land. Remediation doesn't necessarily mean digging it all up and moving it to a landfill somewhere else. Um, and it may be optimal to use controls to manage that site long term. And if we're using controls, that doesn't necessarily mean we can't reuse the site. And you see many, um, this done often in the redevelopment industry to enable the reuse of urban sites. So this is a really important concept. But we have to characterise these sites so we can understand the risks. And, and that is something that we're really promoting in our member states to make sure they understand the risks so we can make informed decisions about the way forward. So the IAEA is a diverse organisation drawing from the expertise of its 172 member states and it employs over a thousand women um, within technical roles and there are many stories just like mine. However, um, our Director General recognises that there is uh, room for improvement. So there is a commitment uh, to increase um, gender balance amongst the professional staff and the senior management at the IAEA. And that was a commitment our Director General made two years ago, and uh, we are on good target for that. Um, the other thing that we are doing to uh, positively impact um, women, uh, to bring women into the nuclear field, um, is the launch of the Mary Stokowski Curie Fellowship Programme. Um, hopefully some people may have heard this. Um, the fellowship provides financial support for 100 female students a year undertaking master degree programmes in a wide range of nuclear and nuclear related subjects, including non-proliferation and uh, technical subjects, uh, including chemistry and physics, um, all these kind of uh, really um, exciting, <laughs> they are exciting, believe me, um, topics. So uh, the fellowship provides financial support uh, towards tuition fees and living costs for up to two years. And students will also be provided with an opportunity to pursue an internship facilitated by the IAEA for up to 12 months following uh, the completion of the master's degree. The first 100 recipients of the scholarship were awarded last November, November 2020. That first cycle of fellowship scheme attracted more than 550 candidates. So there's a brilliant illustration of how important it is um, to support women in technical and political disciplines. Um, and that was from more than uh, 90 countries. The 100 selected students came from 71 member states and uh, all world regions, and they will study at 40 uh, accredited uh, universities. The programme has received more than 5 million euros in pledges and the agency is grateful and proud of this support and continues to encourage other member states to join the initiative. 
Personally, I'm excited to see the paradigm shift that has been occurring over the last five years to be inclusive of women in technical and political disciplines. During my career, it has not been unusual to be the only woman in the, in the room. <laughs> and it's also not unusual to have been uh, considered as the administrative support rather than the technical support. However, there is finally recognition that women are essential part of the workforce needed to enable progress and innovation. And I just want to reiterate a uh, previous pan panel's kind of comments um, make connections, reach out. Um, it's all about who you know and learn from those people, um, those connections, those mentors. And also be brave and, and embrace the challenge. Um, you need to be, uh, you need to persevere and have tenacity. That's something that often gets used to describe me. And I think it's a good thing. So yeah, be encouraged and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Baines, um, also for talking about this incredible opportunity. And now, Heather, Dr. Williams, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, um, Federica. Thank you, Elena, <clears throat> for organizing this and just for leading on this initiative and encouraging uh, early career experts and women in the field. Um, hi, everybody. It's really nice to see some familiar names on the list. Um, I'm also gonna largely stick to the questions, um, the ways that the field is changing, Pros, and then I'll talk a little bit about pros and cons of working in academia and think tanks just to offer a different perspective. And then I'm, I'm gonna spend a bit of time at the end talking about specific skills and suggestions um, for, you know, for any kind of um, early career people on the call who might be you know, hoping to stay in this field and advance uh, your career. But just at the outset, I really wanna reinforce what um, quite a few of the other speakers have said about planning and having a plan for your career. Um, and I will openly say I always have a plan and I absolutely had a plan for my career and I never stuck to it. Um, at, you know, at the start of my career, I wanted to be a Russian translator and then I wanted to work in government. I never wanted to be an academic and I've kind of ended up here. Um, and so I, th I think the big takeaway from what a lot of us have been saying is be open to diverse opportunities, seize those opportunities when they come along. Um, as Dr. Bain said, be brave, <laughs> uh, but ultimately do follow what you're most interested in. Don't always uh, feel like you have to follow what you think you should be doing or what you're supposed to do in your career path. Your interest really should be the driver. Um, so just to start um, on how the field has changed, um, at least from when, um, so when I started in the field about uh, 18 years ago now, um, it's definitely a lot more diverse. Uh, after getting my master's degree, I briefly worked in the Department of Defense in the US and a defense think tank. And I was almost always the only woman in the room, uh, was often thought of as the intern. Um, my first big government briefing was to a group of 40 men, all of whom were over the age of 60. Uh, and so that was a little bit daunting. The field has definitely changed since then. You don't see that quite so often these days. If it, if at all. Um, but to be clear, I, I do think that we can do a lot better and there is still a lot of work to be done in making the field more open to women, to people of color. Uh, and so I would really encourage everyone on the call, if you haven't already, to link up with initiatives such as Gender Champions and WCAPS, uh, Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, um, because they offer really practical suggestions for how to try to improve the field. Um, the field has also changed in that it's a lot more cross-generational engagement and there's a lot more mentoring opportunities. Um, again, kind of when I started off, it, I found it really hard to approach the, the experts, the established people in the field. And I'm guessing we've all been at those kind of uh, receptions where you're standing in a corner and you feel like you don't know anybody and you don't know how to go up and talk to them. I think it's a lot easier now. It, um, people are a lot more approachable. There's a lot more women involved in mentoring um, and there are a lot, um, a lot more opportunities um, to find a mentor, such as work that Sarah Bidgood at CNS and also through VCDMP are doing. Um, and so just to kind of encourage people to, to, if you feel like you want a mentor, you just want someone to help you kind of find your way, don't be afraid to ask. Um, I, as I said, people are more approachable and most people in this field are really nice, um, which is a good thing. Um, and then also just the issues have changed a lot in the field. Um, the, 
you know, the nuclear landscape, the disarmament and deterrence landscape, it's so much more complex now. There are these huge, big or first order questions that get to not just politics, but also psychology and history and economics. And we really need new ideas and new creative thinking. So things like, can you apply arms control to cyber? Does public opinion matter on nuclear weapons? Who decides when, where, and how disarmament happens? These are massive questions and we need a lot of big brains in the room um, to try to solve them. And so it's a really exciting time, I think, to start engaging with these issues and in the field. Um, a few observations about working in academia um, and I'll say a little bit about think tanks just to try to capture some NGO perspectives. Um, so the, the pros and the cons, right? So the pros of working in academia at least are, you really have total independence. Uh, especially once you get tenure, you can kind of say and do what you want uh, within you know, certain legal limits, obviously. Um, but you can work on what topics you're interested in. You, um, you, know, you don't have to put your, whatever you write, you don't have to put it through like a ma massive review process. Um, you have a lot more control over what topics you work on compared to some government officials. Um, and also you have the time and the space to do a really deep dive. If there's something that you just feel like it's, it is really complex, you wanna do a lot of research, maybe years of research, academia gives you the time and the space to do that. Um, that's, I think, why I ended up here where, um, you know, in government, I think I would have a hard, I might have sometimes have a hard time sticking to the line when you, if you want to be a bit more outspoken. Um, the downsides, uh, at least with academia, if you want to work in academia, you do need a PhD. Um, I pursued a PhD, not because I wanted to work in academia, but I just had this deep burning question about US Russia arms control. And I think if anyone is thinking about a PhD, I'm happy to talk about that more, but make sure that you're doing it because you have a deep and burning question. Don't do it just because you can't find a job or because you think that it'll just help promote your career. Because by the end of this PhD, you will want to do anything other than work on it. Um, a few people know at the end of my PhD, in like the final months, I decided to take up candle making. I'm not even joking because I just didn't want to work on it anymore. And so you have to love your topic because it'll bring you back to it. Um, and then also just kind of an observation about academia. Academia is also changing. It, it definitely isn't that you're off in an ivory tower disconnected from the policy community. Um, I think you get to decide what type of an academic you want to be. I very consciously chose that I wanted to engage with policy and contemporary questions. Um, and frankly, I was really surprised by how open and engaging policymakers were, that they are willing to talk to academics. Often they really like to tell their stories. Um, you know, for example, I see Ambassador um, Benno Lagner is on the call and also Jenny Grommel from the State Department. And those are two people who, um, when I was doing my research, were just incredibly giving with their time um, and helpful. So don't be afraid to engage with the policy things. Um, and just to start wrapping up, I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about skills and really practical stuff and how to engage. Um, the number one skill that I think you need in this field, whether you're in government, academia, think tanks, you have to be able to write. It seems really obvious, but whether you're writing a book for academia or a memo in government, you have to be able to write really clearly. Um, you have to know your audience. Also, it helps if you can write something interesting, if you can kind of get the attention of the person that you're engaging with. Um, as I said, there's all these big questions out there and we need creative thinking, but you have to be able to get your ideas across. And this is something I don't, you know, I don't think it's always taught um, explicitly um, how to do this type of writing. So I really encourage people to start kind of practicing that and engaging with it um, as, as early as you can. So three specific things that I think um, early career people can do, but also maybe more established experts on the call that you can encourage people that you work with to do. Um, so the first thing is just, just write something, write a blog, write a policy piece. I would say don't start off trying to write for foreign affairs. <laughs> that's that's going to be a really big stretch. Start with something small, maybe a 500 word blog post, write it for your university, reach out to think tanks like VCDMP, the European Leadership Network, see if they're willing to kind of give you some space to, um, to get your ideas out there. Um, second thing that you can do is if you have done a master's degree 
um, is to, to convert your master's dissertation into a journal article. Um, a great place to do this is the Nonproliferation Review, which is a journal that focuses on WMD and security issues. Um, but I mean, you've put all that time into the master's degree, you may as well try to get something a bit more public out of it, right? Um, and then the last thing is going back to this mentoring point is um, reach out to people, ask a more senior person to help you with your writing project. They might not always be willing to co-author with you because that's sometimes a big ask. Ask them to read over your draft, ask them for feedback, say, you know, I've never written a blog post, how do I start? Um, just come to it, you know, with that kind of beginner's mind and a bit of curiosity about the process. Um, and most of the time, I found at least people will are, really are giving with their time and will be helpful within reason. Um, other skills that obviously you need, you have to know how to just do basic analysis. Um, this is another thing that I think could be taught more explicitly. But in your kind of education and career progression, always seek out those opportunities to do analysis or to have someone explain to you what analysis is and their process. Um, and then also presentation skills. Can you give a briefing? This gets back to, it's great if you have a creative idea, you have to be able to get it across. Um, and then final point I'm gonna end on is be someone that people want to work with. This seems really obvious and I'm not saying that you need to be the most popular kid in the lunchroom at all, but be somebody who does really basic things like meet deadlines, um, write you know, polite emails, um, be someone who is like encouraging to the rest of your team uh, and can just, you know, um, and can contribute to this, all these bigger efforts that we are all working towards. Um, because as I've at least found as kind of my career advanced, this really is a community. And for the most part, everyone knows each other to some extent. Um, and do they all, everyone does try to collaborate because we're dealing with literally some of the most challenging questions on earth right now. Um, and the stakes are really high. So I'll stop there, but um, thanks again so much, Federica. Thank you, thank you, Heather. Amazing points have been raised during these past 43 minutes. Um, I'll sum them up. Uh, a little bit. So be open to new opportunities, be brave, follow, follow your interests, pick a good boss, uh, take up challenges, um, ask for help and reach out to people. And last but not least, be nice. I think these are very great advice. Um, we have about half an hour for q and I I know either actually you have to leave right at four. Um, but thank you anyways for, for your availability. And so I've um, tried to collect the questions that we've received um, until this morning into groups. And after we address some of them, we will open the floor for discussion. So the first question that I would like to ask to all of you um, comes from Tsui Yungen from the Australian Permanent Mission to the UN in Geneva. And she asks, uh, what is the most rewarding aspect of your career so far? And also another question related to these is, what do you wish you had known when you began working in this field? Um, Again, in the interest of time, since we have so many questions, perhaps a few remarks uh, by all of you, and then we can go back to other questions. Um, Angela, would you like to start? Maybe I we can follow are, the order. Okay. The, uh, yeah, uh, most rewarding aspect of your career. Uh, I think that's a hard one because um, if, uh, if I think about disarmament, I uh, have had a very long career and I would have picked not necessarily about the disarmament and arms control, I would have picked something else. But on the other hand, I think whatever it is that you do, I don't think there's ever one single rewarding moment. I think basically what you're looking for is you're looking over a number of years and, you know, as I said, coming from a long career, you look over where have you been able to make a difference? And I 
go back to what uh, what several of you said is very important is always try to learn something new and don't wait until you know the whole field i think it was kiaski who said that which was a very good point but you have to basically plunge into it and that basically also brings a reward first of all the reward that you're learning something and you're staying engaged and you're staying interested in the topic but the other thing is is that every time and in the un it's very very hard to make progress because it doesn't all depend on you it depends mostly on member states it depends mostly on you know what is why who is sitting at the table but on the other hand if you can move the goalpost in any particular way just a little bit that in itself is extremely uh, rewarding and um, what 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 would i have known uh, i think that uh, what uh, would have been really nice to have and it's not necessarily that you know it but just like kim was talking about sometimes she was the only woman at the table and when i started my career uh, then uh, I was very often also the only woman at the table. And that is, a, is, is, is intimidating in many ways because you don't really know how to behave. And very often you get talked over by men. What I, would have, what I would wish I would have known is how to be more assertive right from day one. I think that is something that you learn, but I wish I would have known that and been more assertive when I started my career rather than learning it as the years went by. Let me stop there. Thank you, Angela. Um, Ambassador? Maybe we can just follow the, the same uh, path that we followed before for the remark. Uh, thank you. I think the most rewarding um, aspect of my work is that I've been able to work on something that has been important for me every single day. Uh, it's been important to me and to my country. Uh, it's issues that I feel make a difference. Uh, so it makes a difference to me, you know, whether or not I work on this or something else. So I think it's a, it's a personal sort of gratitude also uh, for being allowed to, to work on, on foreign policy and being a diplomat. Um, what I wish I should have known, I shouldn't have worried so much, uh, especially at the end of my studies, because I really, really worried. Will I be able to find work? Will I find something interesting? Um, and uh, uh, will I be able to combine, you know, work with my family? I shouldn't have worried so much. Things, um, you will face some challenges and you will have some rewards. Um, and no, I should not have worried so much. But I think one thing that I would like to say at this point is that um, if you're the only woman in a room uh, or um, the only woman in the top position or the only woman that's, you know, even also at the lower levels, it's really difficult to change things for one woman alone. Um, my experience and, and the history of my ministry is that you need to have more women at all levels for change to happen because it's also um, too much to demand of one person to change everything so to to talk to female colleagues and to have that network uh, and to to agree on what do we want to change here if, where we work I think that is very important thanks thank you ambassador Dr Bain I think there's a lot of uh, commonalities there with uh, what I would say, and and it is really difficult to pick one one event. And I certainly feel that um, I've been privileged to do something that I'm passionate about, um, and therefore those things that stick out are where I've seen a practical difference. So for me, I'm a very practical person. So to see a site go from I don't know a petrol station um, to uh, some houses. Um, is a really kind of good thing for me. I think the other thing is um, I have three children. Um, I have been homeschooling um, and actually being able to share my passion with them um, and to be able to, they must, they must get so fed up with me, but you know, if there's a simple science question, I've got to go the extra mile to explain why and, and you know, and share that passion. So I think for me, that's been, that continues to be one of the highlights. And then uh, in terms of, um, you know, I wish I'd known, my passion has continued to carry me through. And in those times where I feel slightly overwhelmed and, and you know, not sure which way to go or who to speak to, the fact that I'm so passionate about what I do always kind of wins out. So, uh, yeah, just to, to hold on to what you're passionate about and, and to know that that will see you through. Um. 
Um, sure, I'll, I'll jump in, Federica. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Abby. So uh, what I find the most rewarding is actually teaching, and that's probably something I should have talked about in terms of being an academic that you do have to teach. Um, I didn't think I would like teaching very much. Um, the thing that I like the most about teaching, though, is I, it's a cliche, but the students definitely teach me more than I teach them. Um, we had, um, you know, we, we did, um, lead an arms control masters at King's and some of the students who have come through, it's just seeing how they look at the world from this totally different perspective and that you get so much time with them that you can have that a little bit of a shift and you just see the world a bit differently. Um, and so I think that for me, that's, that's the most rewarding thing. Um, what do I wish that I'd known? I wish that I'd known that what makes you different is your superpower. Um, that if you've had some different or unique experience, that is the thing often that can really help you advance your career, have an impact. Just two really quick examples. Um, when I started my PhD in 2010 on US-Russia arms control, New START was just being ratified. And everyone in my PhD cohort was like, Heather, you're so passe. Like arms, US-Russia conflict is, it's so in the past. You know, why are you studying this? A month before I submitted my dissertation uh, was when the State Department announced that Russia was violating the INF Treaty. Um, I had to go back and rewrite half the dissertation, but um, that you know that made like my interest in that made me <laughs> made me really different. All of a sudden, that was a high value. The second one um, is something that you know I, I I know that I think I've talked to Angela about this before in particular. That um, when I worked at Chatham House, I got involved in the humanitarian impacts movement pretty much from the beginning in 2012, 2013. I went to all the conferences. And a lot of my colleagues, particularly in the US, just said, why are you getting into this? Like, you work on deterrence issues. This thing isn't going anywhere. Um, and I, I felt, honestly, I felt a bit like an outlier. And I was kind of like, am I, you know, is this a massive career risk? Am I making the wrong choice? But I just thought it was a really important and interesting initiative. Um, and because I had gotten involved early, um, it, it did kind of give me a different experience from others. And I'm really glad that I, that, you know, Patricia always kind of gave me that opportunity. But so, but, you know, these are all things that you are going to be an outlier sometimes. You might have to stand alone occasionally on an issue, but that thing that makes you different, it can be your superpower. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, on career advices, we have, we had a few people asking pretty much the same question. Like I have a life science background, I have an engineering background, I have a legal, legal background, or I am a biochemist. This means I have no knowledge about non-proliferation and disarmament or international relations, politics and governance. Is this um, a requirement to be able to enter in the field? Um, can I enter the field without a master's degree? And if not, do you recommend any specific master's degree or to get a PhD? I know Heather actually um, answered a little bit about the PhD part and Angela um, answered about the importance of having um, a political background. But if any one of you wants to take on this question, um, please let me know. Let me just quickly jump in here. And I think that that's, depends really on what you want to do and where you can work and who is going to give you a job. If that's your dream to pursue, then basically you're going to have to bone up on more knowledge. You can't just enter the field and not have any background knowledge or expertise of anything and then expect someone to give you a job. So that's just simply not going to work. So the entry point has to be either you want to do an internship or you improve your knowledge or you sort of see if you can, um, you know, volunteer somewhere. It, it doesn't really matter. But I think you have to have more of a plan as to what it is that you want to do. And then you have to have somehow map out a way how you're going to get there. But you need to have more knowledge. You can't just swim from one to the other. And let me just say something about the UN, because right now it was easier when I was in the UN, particularly in the early stages, because you moved around just like in the diplomatic service. You got from one function where you did something very, very different to another function. I personally think 
that in many ways that's also good because it keeps you fresh and it keeps you learning and it keeps you engaged. But on the other hand, in the UN now, unless you've studied in a particular field, you cannot enter except in that one field. And you cannot get a job unless you can prove that you have certain numbers of years of experience already in the field before you move into that. So there are restrictions, but you have to really map as to how, how do you want to end up uh, going and where do you want to go? Thank you, Angela. Um, anyone wants to jump in on this or should we go to the next question? Maybe we can go to the next question then, um, which is actually related to what Angela just said right now. Um, a group of people asked um, about the, the pandemic situation. The pandemic had severe consequences for um, young graduates. Um, we weren't able to do internships and in, in person and sometimes not even remotely. How do, you, how do I enter the field during a situation like this? Or how do I re-enter the field um, if I had to leave it um, because I, I couldn't find any opportunity? And last but not least, um, how do I enter the field if I wasn't successful so far? How, is imp how important is it to network? And last question, which networks and organizations should one look at when looking for mentors in the field? A lot of questions in one group. Um, any takers, or should we go? Should it? Should we do a round again, as before? I could maybe just give some kind of general comments. Obviously, uh, non-proliferation isn't my technical background, um, and I appreciate how difficult it, it has been. I've kind of been on both ends in terms of uh, seeing how people and myself have kind of struggled to kind of engage with things when they're more remotely but also having to try and deliver stuff to people to make sure that they could understand um, and it is a difficult situation I think we kind of come back to that perseverance and tenacity thing you know if you if you're passionate about doing this you will find a way um, and it might take you a little bit longer um, and you might have to look at some routes that you might not normally have thought about but but you know from the other side employers potential employers are impressed that you have gone out and you have uh, taken the initiative and that you have um, learned information you've volunteered you've taken on as many roles that demonstrate the types of skills and disciplines within the area that you're interested in. Um, and I think, you know, particularly in the current context, actually you might, you might find it's easier for people to find little things for you to do um, because there's not the massive responsibility of looking after someone for a period. So you might be able to review some documents um, or to um, uh, help kind of organize some information um, or even, to, to go through training uh, and to provide feedback on that. So yeah, I just say persevere. Thank you, Dr. Baines. Uh, yes, Ambassador Anderson. Um, it's, a, it's a complex question. Um, the thing about the pandemic is that we don't really know yet how it will affect young people now uh, searching for jobs and internships. Uh, it, it is difficult uh, for those who are now um, looking for jobs or looking for internships. Um, the only thing is, it's pretty much uh, the same way for everyone. So uh, in a year's time, when this uh, hopefully passes, um, employers will sort of treat everyone in the same way because uh, it's been, um, it, <laughs> the pandemic has been equal and has hurt opportunities for everyone. Um, if you can do anything online to, to add to your education, um, those who know more than one area uh, are often people that are very valuable to diplomacy. Uh, languages, always um, interesting. Um, and my impression is that the most difficult thing is to get that first job. When you get that first job, uh, be, as Heather said, someone uh, that uh, the rest would like to work with. I think that is very important. Um, and uh, do remember that career is never sort of a straight line. Uh, most of us have done 
different things, um, uh, but try to find the things that you're passionate about, that you care about, where you learn something new um, that you can add to your uh, experiences and knowledge. And if I can just quickly jump in to add, you know, uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said. We really just don't know yet about the pandemic and what's going to be the outcome. But I would say if you are interested in going into think tanks, um, or, you know, pursuing a master's or a PhD, obviously I'm going to say this, but I would use this time to write. Um, you know, when I get a lot of job applications for people who want to come work at um, the center at King's or who want to work on various projects, um, I would say maybe only 10% of them have published something, even if it's just a blog post. That is always the thing that stands out on a CV for me is, and again, it could just, you know, it could be your university's department student blog. It kind of doesn't matter. It just shows that you were willing to take a little bit of an intellectual risk and put yourself out there and that you started that career development and that skills development process. And so it seems like, you know, you're, we're all stuck in front of our computers. We may as well try to write something. Um, much easier said than done is someone trying to finish a book. Um, and just a very quick kind of comment on mentoring, because I saw um, Betty, hi Betty, um, question in the um, box, which gets to this and what Federica had asked as well. Um, I, I do think having a mentor is important. I get it's really hard now. I really would encourage people to get in touch with um, Sarah Bidgood and the CNS mentoring program that she's put together. Um, I'm one of the mentors on it. It's really phenomenal. It's a really great opportunity. But then I would also just encourage, um, you know, kind of younger women on the call. I really do think it's beneficial to have a female mentor at some point. I didn't have a female mentor until I was in my 30s when I met Patricia Lewis, um, who I kind of forced her to be my mentor. Um, but, uh, you know, when I had had male mentors before as a young woman in the field in your 20s, you're going to have awkward situations that you don't know how to deal with. And some, you know, some men handle it better than others, um, but it can be harder for them to understand, obviously. Um, having a female mentor was just one of the most wonderful opportunities and privileges that I had. Um, just to have someone say, I've been there, I really know how you feel, and offering very practical tools for how to, you know, do you deal with it? What do you do? Well, how do you move on? And so I'm um, just to really encourage people to engage with that program that Sarah is doing as well. Thank you so much to all of you. And yes, Angela. Uh, I wanted to come back to the question on networking, which I also found very interesting. And it basically sounded like what networks can we recommend to get in touch with? And I just want to clarify something because I know that I think it was Heather who mentioned earlier networking. And yes, networking is extremely important, but there isn't a way that one can make network one's profession. And some people do. And I hate to tell you, but they're really obnoxious. I mean, I can't stand people who spend all of that time, quote, networking. You know, they want to have a coffee with you or they want to talk or whatever. Uh, it is something that develops naturally. It develops naturally when you're reaching out and maybe you are at a reception or maybe you are at a lecture. And I know it's very hard now because it's much, much harder during the pandemic to, to quote, network and get in touch with people who you see on a screen rather than maybe sidling up to them at a meeting or something and sort of say, oh, you know, I found it very interesting what you had to say and maybe you can discuss it a little bit. But one of the things that I have to be care, I have to care, and make sure that you are careful about is that you don't abuse people with whom you network. And some people do do that. I mean, I've had someone that I've said out of the goodness of my heart, yes, I'll write your recommendation. And the next thing I know is I get two more requests in the same way. And I just will not do that because that really is abusing the goodwill that we all have to help younger people to do this. So you have to be very careful. It's something that develops naturally. And maybe it's not only you wanna be someone who people wanna work with, but maybe it's also someone you wanna be someone who people wanna network with. Uh, that's it is it's a two-way street it's not a one-way street and some people only think it's a one-way street and that is that is something that is interesting coming back to the mentoring very very quickly i have never had a woman mentor simply because you know i I'm, I'm kind of older, so at that time there were just no women around who would be a mentor. And men mentors uh, also, I think it's very good to have a mentor, but you have to be also very careful. And I think there are also cultural issues that one has to think about. And particularly in the UN, where you're working with, or diplomacy or anywhere now these days, where you're working with a whole gamut of, of cultures, of, of attitudes, 
And you have to be very, very careful that you stay very much with a certain framework that you both agree on, and then you follow that framework. And it is a bit more formal than maybe you want to do. That mentor or the mentee is not going to be your best friend. It's a working relationship as far as I'm concerned. And sometimes, you know, the, the people don't quite understand how that works, but we have to be very careful on that. Thank and you, just quickly Anna. adding, to, in terms of uh, networks, another thing to look at if you're looking for nuclear kind of disciplines, there's Women in Nuclear, um, which is another big network that provides uh, mentoring resources. So if you just Google Women in Nuclear, you'll find uh, information on that. Federica, I have to duck out now, but I just very quickly wanted to say to everyone on the panel, thank you so much. It was great to see you all and I learned a lot from everybody. And thank you again to Federica and Elena for organizing this. Um, and again, I'm really sorry I have to go, but bye. <laughs> Thanks, Feder. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And Yelena, you wanted to say something too, right? Hey, uh, I'll use the opportunity to tell that one of the speakers have to leave. Uh, a few points uh, as we were discussing, but first of all about the mentorship is uh, that's exactly some of the uh, discussion we just had about the impact of COVID and general importance of mentorship. That is exactly why we are uh, starting this uh, mentorship uh, program, new mentorship program that II and BCD and P are going to be collaborating and you can find more information on, on, on the website and the links are also posted in chat for people who follow. But what I wanted to say is that uh, I feel a little bit of awkward that we are, uh, what we are discussing is uh, we're really sending the, uh, mostly speak about the women's experience. I think for many young people, whether they are male or female nowadays, they, they face very similar issues. And I think the discussions we're having, and uh, of course, we would like uh, to help young women too, but in general, the gen next generation uh, is really uh, benefited, could benefit from all the tips and advice and networking and everything that we're discussing today and will be uh, supporting. Um, uh, there were questions about what you could do in the meantime, how could you learn more, whether, where you could do it, uh, including about the degrees. Um, I, uh, first of all, there are so many opportunities. I wish there were so many different courses, summer programs and other opportunities than uh, when I was starting in the field, there was nothing practically, um, uh, except for the degree program that Federica and I <laughs> share at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Um, I'll, I'll mention it a little bit later, but nowadays there are many of them. Uh, one thing that I want, I would like to recommend for now is to indeed check that initiative uh, that uh, Heather mentioned, a young women in non-proliferation at the uh, Center for Non-proliferation Studies uh, website. It already has some resources, good resources with various internships with programs like summer two, three weeks programs, online opportunities for where you could learn uh, a lot about this field. Uh, and our intention also, uh, as we develop our initiative to uh, collate a, a similar resource, but maybe uh, uh, drawing more from other kind of geographical areas to supplement what um, Sarah Bidgood is doing. And in terms of the formal degree, programs. Um, there are obviously a number of, uh, um, and it's growing, a number of institutions where there are specific programs where you can uh, take an advanced degree, a uh, master's degree. Sometimes if you already have one master, you may be able to take just one year program. Uh, and if and surprisingly for the institute uh, where I got my degree and worked with at the Middlebury, Middlebury Institute of International Studies, I think it's one of the best combinations if you have technical background or some other background, and then you take a master's degree or, or even this one year advanced degree in WMD non-proliferation and terrorism studies. That's the combination that's a win-win combination uh, for securing a very interesting job it opens many doors, um, but there are many other degrees. The King's College where uh, Heather Williams teaches 
uh, in, in London. Uh, there are a few, a number of universities in Europe. If you're really interested, I'm sure you can find this information, including at that resource that I have already mentioned. Uh, I'll stop here and let others speak. Thank you, Federico, for giving me floor. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Yelena, for giving this overview about the Greece and also the, the program that we're trying to establish. Ambassador Anderson, did you raise your hand or was I mistaken? Okay. Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to remind uh, those who are listening in here that most embassies actually have internships uh, or trainees. Uh, so you could approach your country's embassy uh, or permanent mission uh, in uh, relevant uh, capitals uh, to see if they have anything that you could uh, apply for. Uh, and I would also like to just to comment on the, uh, the network versus networking, because that are in my head, that's two completely different things. Um, networking is, um, can be, um, uh, well, uh, obnoxious is one word. Uh, it's, uh, it's part of a, of a job for some, uh, but to have a network is more uh, something, you can have a formal network uh, like, uh, uh, women in peace and security, you know, whatever, but uh, the informal network is based on uh, a common interest um, and uh, some sort of support and, and understanding. So it's more of an informal network that I feel is important uh, to have, um, but uh, really at all levels of your um, career. Um, when it comes to having a mentor, um, you know, formal programs, my experience is that it's very good when they're limited in time, because then you can have a mentor for a couple of months or for half a year, and then you can see, you know, how this develops. And you can both really learn from each, each other, uh, and it can develop into a long-term mentorship, but that's when that both uh, or all those um, uh, in, the, in the program sort of decide that that is the right uh, way to go uh, for them. So I just wanted to add some, some more thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We actually just have three minutes left and so many other questions. Next time we definitely have to do a longer uh, event. Um, perhaps we can address this question about stereotypes. Um, there is one question who, that was submitted yesterday uh, that says, I would like to educate people in my country about the importance of, of having women working in science. How do I do that? And uh, tied it with the first question we've received, um, what advice can you give to women who work in security organizations where gender equality is talked about in theory, but less in practice and mostly male management structure is unwilling to understand how their environment doesn't encourage women to stay. Um, any taker? So um, I think that last question was quite an interesting question. Yeah, I've certainly worked in a few organisations where there's a lot of talk, but not action. Um, and it is really difficult because um, you could kind of, it can evoke kind of a feeling of frustration, but actually uh, you kind of have to come in the opposite spirit um, and you have to give these people kind of the time to let them speak and kind of, talk about what they think so you can help them understand the reality. Um, so I think you just have to, part of it is about modeling uh, the benefits of having a diverse uh, culture and not just uh, becoming frustrated about it, but it, it is frustrating. I have been there <laughs> and do see it. Yeah, didn't we all actually, <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, but we, oh yes, Ambassador Anderson. I'll be very brief. Um, I will always encourage uh, people to use the formal channels that are available to you in an organization to argue your case uh, and to put forward uh, the points that you have. If that is um, uh, service on work environment, uh, contact with ombudsperson, um, there are normally in an organization, there are some, some formal channel, channels that you can use. Um, and, and you should uh, make use of it. Thanks. Thank you. That's let, me, let me add something here. And again, that comes from my experience at the UN. Now, you know that there were 
conferences on, on women you know, that started already many years ago. And uh, there were general assembly resolutions in the UN that asked for gender equality, and none of that was observed in the early days. So what did the UN women do? And there were very few senior women, they were mostly like mid-level and lower levels, including myself. There was a group that was formed that was an advocacy group and every year on 8 March, we had a big to do in the General Assembly Hall and we asked the Director of Personnel or the Assistant Secretary General of Personnel, we asked ambassadors, we asked everyone we could and grilled them and there was one woman and she was a D1 and those of you in the UN system know what a D1 is. I mean, for me, this was just the pinnacle of power to have a D1. And it was wonderful because she was totally unafraid and she challenged these men about what are you doing about this? And it took a long time to change. One of the things that uh, I, and I'm, I'm glad that Kiesti is here, that was really important uh, for me as I was kind of coming up through the ranks, uh, the, um, uh, the Nordic ambassadors were primarily, not primarily, but they were very often more women than, 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 than men. And so they had like a little power group that they put together. And uh, that was, we would have like dinners and formal dinners or something. And just to be admitted to that group of women who were powerful and who had something to say and who actually took what you had to say as important was a wonderful experience. It was very, very empowering. And uh, I can only say that this is something that I've always thought would be good to replicate somewhere because it is very empowering to just be given the message that, you know, yes, I mean, you know, there, there's a group of us. And what we did at the UN also is when we had um, senior women, for example, we had like a deputy SRSG and there was the delegates dining room. And so we started and we sort of said, if someone comes once a month, we will have a women's group, a senior women's group. And we booked a big table, like a round table. And we sat there and it was only women. And the men would always come afterwards and sort of say, what was that all about? What was that all about? But you have to send a signal. It's very important. And, you know, this is, these are just sort of some little anecdotes that I can share with you. And maybe you say, you know, it cannot be replicated, but yes, you can, because you can, you can promote kind of an advocacy network, so to say, or a group of like-minded women who are supporting each other. That's very, very important. And I agree with Kirsty. Yes, I mean, you have to use the channels to challenge it, but sometimes it's just pushed off the table. And I just want to give you one other example. It used to be that in the UN, you had a committee where you looked at candidates who were supposed to be hired. And I remember there was one case where there was a woman who I thought was extremely qualified, but because of family reasons, she had dropped out of the working life for about four years. And she'd actually accompanied her husband to another country and she did all kinds of interesting things. And basically the men were all ready to dismiss that experience. And basically, oh, she's dropped out. You know, she can't take this. She doesn't have the experience, et cetera. And I argued for her because I believed in her and I thought that what she did was really important. I mean, in her constraints of not having a job, but she had other jobs that she was doing but they were not necessarily paid. And she did get to the UN and actually she made it very fast up the ladder because she was just really good. And it, I think that's not something that a man necessarily, maybe yes, and I don't, don't want to cast dispersions on, on men, but at the time that I was in that committee, no man was willing to support me. And in the end, you know, I was just basically forcing them. And that was one of the channels that you mentioned, the formal channels where one could do that. And it was a very positive experience, I thought. For women in general, it gave a good signal. Thank you so, so much for, for these insights. I'm, I am afraid it's already 4.20, so we've finished our time. And I'm sorry for all those questions that we were not able to address, but we will do more events like this. And so I just would like to close the event thanking so much. First of all, Yelena and Mara for the great collaboration in creating this. And second of all, our speakers for being so available and nice and for all the incredible insights that um, they gave us today. And Yelena, I don't know if you want to say two last words. No, uh, I'm, I'm really delighted that we uh, were able to do it. And as I mentioned at the uh, opening that this is just the uh, first event, the inaugural event. And I hope we'll have more meetings and use this time and these new opportunities that are provided by virtual technologies to at least connect in, in this format. But thank you, Federica, for um, uh, chairing the session. And thank you, Angela, thank you, Kirsty, thank you, Kim and Heather, who has left us. That was fantastic. And thank you for being such a uh, wonderful, uh, strong women, powerful and uh, helping uh, others in, in the field as well. 
thank you all and have a safe and uh, nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.